Today, I'm down here at John Kufleitner's to look at this personal size 1956 Ford Thunderbird. But before we take the tour, a bit of background information on the 56 Ford Thunderbird. If you just stumbled upon this channel, welcome. If you dig the content, I'd invite you to hit that subscribe button and turn on all post notifications so you never miss a video that is dropped. The original plan for the Ford Thunderbird was to be direct competition for Chevy's Corvette before it ended up making a totally new market segment called the personal luxury car because the Thunderbird wasn't sold as a straight up sports car. It was more than that. There was more personal luxury amenities on the Thunderbird than the Corvette. In 1956, the Ford Thunderbird outsold the Corvette 10 to 1. In 1955, the Thunderbird sold, outsold the Corvette 23 to 1. So every 23 Thunderbirds that were sold, there was one Corvette sold, which is crazy. Who designed the Thunderbird? Well, that's kind of confusing. The credit goes to like three people. Louis D. Crusoe, who worked for GM, and he was lured out of retirement by Henry Ford II. George Walker, who was a chief stylist and vice president of Ford at one point in time. Frank Hershey, another Ford designer. Story goes Crusoe and Walker was in Paris when Crusoe pointed out a European sports car saying, why can't we have something like this back in the States? Walker called Ford, HQ, and Deborn and spoke to Frank Hershey about the car they just witnessed, and they wanted to turn it into a thing produced by Ford at the time. Now Hershey designed a car with the concept in mind that it was going to be a two-door, two-passenger, open car with a target weight of 2,525 pounds. The power plant that they wanted for this particular car was an Interceptor V8, so a cop engine, so the top speed could be over 100 miles per hour. All right, let's talk about some specs. The 56 Ford Thunderbird rides on a 102 inch wheelbase. The overall length is 175.3 inches long. The weight is between 2,980 pounds and 3,408 pounds. 71.3 inches wide, 52.2 inches tall. The 1956 Ford Thunderbird was essentially a carryover body design from the 55 Ford Thunderbird, but there are some key differences. Let's talk, take a minute and talk about those key differences. All of the 1956 Ford Thunderbirds have a Continental kit on the back or a spare tire that mounts in the back. That is the easiest way to tell if it's a 56 or a 55 because people complained that the 1955 Thunderbird didn't have enough room in the trunk for golf clubs. So they moved the tire to the outside of the trunk so you could carry your golf clubs in the back. The next key difference are these air vents. There's two air vents. There's one on each side, driver and passenger. It's located right behind the front wheel, but before the door. And it opens up, it acts just like a cow vent, but it's on the side. Another key difference is where they put the exhaust on the 55 versus the 56. Because they added a spare tire in the back, they had to move the exhaust ports elsewhere. On the 55, this is what the 55 exhaust ports looked like. They went, the exhaust went through these bumperettes where the spare tire would roughly be. The 56 still had dual exhaust. It was just located alongside the bumper instead of by the spare tire, so you wouldn't get soot all over the spare tire. Thunderbird was unique in the sense that every car made was a convertible. The hard top removed, or you'd have a rag top. The hard top was different in 55. They didn't have a porthole until 56, but in 56, you had the option to either get it with a porthole, aka opera window, or not. You, there was opera window delete. I believe those are all the changes. If I missed anything, put it in the comment section below. They also used the Astro dial from 1955. It was the only Ford product in 1956 to offer the Astro dial. In 1956, Ford was thinking about safety, so they offered their lifeguard design, which was a bunch of safety features, padded dashboard, deep cratered steering wheel. It will act as a cushion as you fall against it whenever you get into a crash, according to them. New seat belts, double grip engagement door latches. At this point at Ford, everything was an option. We're not gonna go through all of the options, but the ones that stick out, four-way power seats, power brakes, power steering, tinted glass, power windows, padded dash, heater, radio, sun visors, seat belts, Wire wheel covers. Notice that they don't have power locks. Ford didn't offer power locks until later. The greatest two. How do you like yours, Bing? Oh, this is quite a vehicle. You know, I've been around some pretty uh, clever horseless carriages in my time. 
time, and uh, that's a bit of time, too. But uh, this beautiful little tea bird, man, this is the performer's performer. And how about this for a continental touch? See, they're taking the spare out of the trunk and put it back here, thus achieving a long, pure line. Don't you think? And look, look at the room you got inside here now. Why, you could throw four hunting dogs, a brace of decoys, and a case of, uh, well, it's pretty roomy. <coughs> What really impresses me is the way Ford's assembly line is turning out peace of mind these days. I'm speaking of lifeguard design, naturally, and you get it in every new Ford this year. Because all 56 Fords have these lifeguard double grip door latches. They keep the door closed no matter what. The steering wheel gives you a good, safe four-inch cushion to keep the steering column from pinning itself to the manly chest in case of an accident. Sort of makes you wonder why all cars don't have it, huh? Well, all Fords do. But you know what really flips me is this telescopic twist. Adjust to the high caloric figure or to the trim, well-built youngsters like me. Now, looky here. Lifeguard padding all around. Man, do my passengers have it soft. I want you to listen to some sweet harmonizing. <laughs> That's what 225 horsepower sounds like. You know, you too can have Thunderbird V8 power, family style, because the Thunderbird engine is standard now in all fair lane and station wagon models. It doesn't cost you a nickel extra. Let me show you a real getaway. First you, uh, oh, wait a minute. Got to have the full wardrobe for this deal. Now, we're all set. Here we go. You are watching, Mr. Bing. You were watching Mr. Bing Crosby and his new 1960. So just check out this door panel. Look how nice this looks. This looks very Corvette-esque. Like this is like a line that Corvettes use. In my opinion. Just notice how it runs down. Door handle to get out. This one's got four-way seats. And that this is the adjustment for it power windows but notice there are no power locks also this has vent windows but it's like they added them after the fact like we want windows electric windows or roll-up windows but we also want vents and this is how this works it's just on the outside of the window frame it's not like traditional has a different compartment this is its own vent window which is very interesting this car does not have a cow hood vent but it has hood vents in the footwells so it has one on this side and i believe there's one on the passenger side as well here's the passenger side so it does have it that lever would be inside here so it allows cold air to come in from outside on a hot day because a lot of people don't realize these engines produce a lot of heat so you feel a lot of heat coming through the firewall this is to help combat that okay let's walk through this dashboard all the button switches and knobs starting from left to right tachometer notice the rpm is times 100 instead of times 10 56 thunderbird use the astra dial the astra dial speedometer slash dashboard was a carryover from the 1955 ford thunderbird thunderbirds came with a 150 mile per hour top speed in the speedo they were the only ford product to do so I was told that the Astra dial was a primitive heads-up display. At night, there is a plexiglass cover to allow light in. And the thought process was so that you could see the numbers in the daylight better. At night, the numbers will shine through the plexiglass cover onto the windshield. You'll be able to see how fast you're going projected onto the windshield. This was the last year for that. Speedometer sits directly in front of the driver as well as an odometer inside. It is flanked by two round dials that jet off and kind of protrude outward. Those are your turn signal indicators. There is a slender rectangular box in the center, has your fuel gauge, oil light, generator light, as well as temperature gauge. Coming back, this one has power steering. Moving back to the speedometer, just off to the right hand side sits a really nice clock. Just under the tachometer, or 
left of the steering wheel is your headlights. Pull them out once for parking, pull them out for the headlights. Right to the right of that is left air control. Right underneath that is the key switch. Moving to the right hand side, wipers, lighter, Town and country radio with radio controls. Notice there is a courtesy light right above it. Moving right still, climate controls. Okay, getting inside, 56 Thunderbird. Did you, did you see that? You have to tuck your head to fit underneath this hood. With the top off of it, it would be so much easier to get in and out of, but with the top on it, it's pretty hard, especially if you're tall. I'm six foot two, I barely fit in this car. And I just wanted to show you this because like for myself, I always thought that, you know, I, I fit in a Nash Metro, I should be able to fit in this. It's easier for me to sit in a Nash Metro than it is in this car. And it's weird because that car is so much more smaller than this car is and the hood gives you the same impression like when you look over the hood and you see the silhouette that the hood gives you it's the same feeling in the Nash Metro just smaller this one has a longer more pronounced hood looks awesome looking over this hood but as you can see now because the steering wheel is so big you have to struggle to turn yourself in here to turn yourself in here and then when you're in here you don't have a whole lot of there isn't a whole lot of headroom and the steering wheel is in your crotch and you're just kind of driving it kind of like hunched over in a way because the floor where the floor and the seat are in this car it's very it's a very weird driving position there's there's no room in it ashtray there people don't realize how big these glove boxes are so for reference i'm going to show you this is the cinematic camera that i use to do all of the cinematic shots of the dashboard and what have you this camera can fit inside this glove box you can't do that in a modern car and, and that's what I, I keep emphasizing the people that they look very small. The one in my truck, no lie, I can fit this camera. I have a series of flashes, a series of flashes, an iPad, an iPad Pro, the big one, as well as this GoPro inside with room left over. So, I mean, and, and you could lock it. People wouldn't think that you have all that stuff inside the glove box. It's very misleading, which is great because people don't think that they're huge, but you can have a treasure trove of stuff inside. Okay, let's talk engines. There was two engines. Uh, the standard engine was the 292 Y block produced 202 horsepower. The optional engine was a 312 Y block. The 312, when paired or mated with a three speed manual, made 215 horsepower. It was rated at 225 horsepower with the Ford O Matic. The Ford O Matic was a three speed automatic transmission. It featured low gear, which could only be accessed in two ways either by switching the gear selector and putting it into drive and under full throttle you'd have three gears or if you put it into low range itself otherwise it operated much like a two-speed power glide transmission 1956 was a huge year for ford because they offered their new 12 volt electrical system so anything after 1956 or mostly everything after 1956 in the ford family is 12 volt all right taking a look at the back here so if you notice this is how you get into the trunk but the gas is right here so question is is how do you open the gas door because obviously you can't get the nozzle into the door well there's a handle right here and you pull down on it and you have to catch this with another hand
there's the mechanism and you just you just pull it down like this and that releases the spare tire when you're done putting gas in just simply click it back into place all right this has always been this has always been kind of a dream of mine to drive a 56 Ford Thunderbird and I'm gonna get to drive it across the parking lot today so as you can see it's really hard getting in and out of this car a lot of people don't convey what this is like the top is very shallow like as you can see here when I shut the door that's that's a door situation there's also seat kind of sits like right on the ground so the the foot wells aren't really deep so getting in and out especially for tall like here's my legs I'm gonna try to get in this is necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do all right I'm in it there's the steering wheel situation it's in my crotch sort of wanted one of these but now sitting in it and driving it, it's really cool it, it handles really well for a car from this time period there just isn't a whole lot of room it's 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 really weird sitting in it this is the view behind the wheel of the Nash Metro and it's actually very cute it feels bigger than it is I wanted to show that the Nash Metro silhouette and the Ford Thunderbird silhouette look very similar if you got series one or series two Nash Metro with the hood scoop it would probably look identical I've never sat in a series one or a series two car anyway getting to the pros and cons I took from the Book that I always take them from, the complete book of collectible cars, uh, Blue Chip Auto Investments, 70 years from 1930 to 2000. And what they have to say about the Ford Thunderbird for the pros, outstanding styling, still looks great, good performance, beginning to gain back value lost in the 1990s, large club support, two-seat mystique. Cons, handling uninspired. I didn't think that it handled bad, but I didn't really drive it very far, to be honest. Some rust, some rust accessibility, and the they're getting to be pricey. I will add one more. If you are six foot five, you will not fit in this car. I did not fit in this car very comfortably. So if you're tall, unless you're planning on driving it without a roof, you will not fit in this car. Plus the way that the um, floorboard is designed there isn't very much it's not like sitting in a 67 mustang when you sit in a mustang your feet go up underneath the dashboard your feet do the same thing in this but it's it's different it's hard to sit in all right guys thank you guys so much for watching i appreciate all the support until next time toodaloo